Hello and welcome back. In this video, I want to describe how we can convert the kinetic energy that is associated with random motion of molecules inside a gas into a useful form of energy which we can use to do work. And the way that we do this is through something called a heat engine. And a heat engine is something which uses a cyclic thermodynamic process which converts heat into work. Now before I start talking about engines, I first need to introduce some terminology which we use to describe the engine. So when we talk about an engine, we say that the engine gets heat from something called a hot reservoir, and we, just, and we denote the heat that is given to the engine as a Q sub H. When the engine is actually running, the engine will lose some of its heat to its surroundings, which we call a cold reservoir, and we denote the heat that is lost by the engine to its surroundings as a Q sub H. Lastly, the engine will do some work which we denote as a W. Now as I mentioned before, heat engines are always described by cyclic thermodynamic processes. This means that if I have a pressure versus volume graph, the process will end at the same place that it starts. This means that the initial pressure is equal to the final pressure, and the initial volume is equal to the final volume. And because of the ideal gas law, this tells us that the initial temperature has to be equal to the final temperature. And finally, because the internal energy of a gas is related to its temperature, if the initial temperature is equal to the final temperature, then the change in the internal energy of the system has to be zero. Now because the change in the internal energy is equal to zero, we can simplify the first law of thermodynamics. Recall that the first law of thermodynamics says the change in the internal energy is equal to the heat that is given to the system plus the work that is done on the gas. Since delta U is equal to zero, we have that Q is going to be equal to minus the work. Now I can further simplify things by rewriting Q in terms of the heat that is given to the engine and the heat that is lost by the engine. So Q is going to be equal to Q sub H, the heat that is given to the engine, minus Q sub C, the heat that is lost by the engine. And this has to be equal to the work that is done by the engine. Now one thing you might have noticed is that when going from this line to this line, I've changed the sign of work. And the reason for this is that when we talk about engines, we describe the work that is being done by the engine as being a positive work. However, when I first introduced the first law of thermodynamics, we used the opposite sign convention to describe work. So this sign convention I have down here is the sign convention that's usually used by engineers. Now if I want to, I could rewrite this equation that I have on this previous slide here, and I could write this as QH is equal to QC plus W. And basically, what this means is that the heat that is given to the engine is either converted into work or it's lost to its environment. So when we talk about an engine, we define the efficiency of the engine as being equal to the fraction of the heat that is put into the engine that is ultimately converted into work. In other words, it's what we get out of the engine divided by what we put into the engine. Now using this equation, QH is equal to QC plus W, we can rewrite this formula. So we have that the efficiency is equal to the work that we get out of the engine divided by the heat that we put into the engine. And we can write the work that we put, the work that we get out of the engine is equal to the heat that we put into the engine minus the heat that we lose from the engine. So this is equal to 1 minus the heat that we lose from the engine divided by the heat that we put into the engine. So let's go ahead and look at an example. This example says engine 1 has an efficiency of 18% and requires 5,500 joules of input heat to perform a certain amount of work. Engine 2 has an efficiency of 26% and performs the same amount of work. The question asks us to determine the amount of heat that we must put into engine 2 so that it does the same amount of work as engine 1. So to answer this question, we need to relate the work that we get out of the engine to the efficiency of the engine and the heat that we put in. Now remember that the efficiency is defined as being equal to the work that we get out of the engine divided by the heat that we put into the engine. So this means the work that we get out of the engine is equal to the efficiency of the engine times the heat that we put into the engine. Now if the two works are, the, the work that's done by engine one is equal to the work that's done by engine two, we have W1 is equal to W2, so the efficiency of engine 1 times the heat that we put into engine 1 has to be equal to the efficiency of engine 2 times the heat that we put into engine 2. Finally, solving for the, the heat that we put into engine 2, we see that this is equal to the heat that we put into engine 1 times the efficiency of engine 1 divided by the efficiency of engine 2. 
So if we plug these numbers into a calculator, we see that the heat that you must put into engine two is equal to 3,808 joules. And we can see, hopefully, that this answer makes sense, right? Engine two is a more efficient engine. It has a 26% efficiency as opposed to the 18% efficiency of engine one. And the heat that we have to put into engine two, is, as a result, it's lower. Now at this point you might be wondering if there are any limitations on the efficiency of an engine. For example, you might wonder whether or not it's possible to build an engine that has 100% efficiency. And this question was first answered by Sadi Carnot, who essentially discovered the thermodynamic process which produces the most efficient engine. And this process is called a Carnot cycle. And the first step of a Carnot cycle is that you add heat to the engine in an isothermal process. So the idea is that you add heat to the gas inside the engine and you allow this gas to expand as heat is added to it so that the temperature of the gas doesn't change. And the reason that we want the first step to be an isothermal step is that according to the first law of thermodynamics, the change in the internal energy is equal to the heat plus the work. So if, it, if the process is isothermal, then the change in the internal energy is equal to zero. So all of the heat that we add during this first step is gonna be converted into work that is done by the engine. Now we can't just use isothermal processes, right? So I'm gonna add heat to the engine during this first step, and because the engine has to be a cyclic process, I have to somehow get back to the starting point. So I can't just use another isothermal process to get back here, because then I'll get zero work. I'll just retrace over this first step, and there'll be no area enclosed. So during the second step, what we do is we adiabatically expand the gas. And the reason that we adiabatically expand the gas is because during an adiabatic step, there is no heat transfer. So there's no heat that's gonna be lost to the environment. So all that heat that we added during the first step is still gonna be there at the end of the second step. And the way that you accomplish an adiabatic step is that you do this very, very quickly. So the step two is so fast that basically the engine doesn't have any time to transfer heat with its environment. Now step three is just the reverse of step one. So we need to come up with some type of way to get back to the beginning, right? So during these first two steps, we've gotten work out of the engine, but now we need to figure out how to get back to the start. And the first step towards this is that we remove heat from the engine in an isothermal process. Okay, so it's just the reverse of step one. And then finally, during the last step, we do another adiabatic compression. So step four is basically like the reverse of step two, and this gets us back to the initial state. And it turns out that the actual calculation of the efficiency of a Carnot engine is a little bit complicated. However, the result is very simple. The efficiency of a Carnot uh, engine is just equal to one minus the temperature of the cold reservoir divided by the temperature of the hot reservoir. Now let's go ahead and look at a simple example. This example says a Carnot engine operates between the temperatures of 650 Kelvin and 350 Kelvin. To improve the efficiency of the engine, you can either increase the temperature of the hot reservoir by 40 Kelvin or decrease the temperature of the cold reservoir by 40 Kelvin. And the question asks us to determine which one of these two would result in a more efficient engine. So this is just a, a very straightforward application of this equation. So the efficiency of the Carnot engine is equal to one minus the temperature of the cold reservoir divided by the temperature of the hot reservoir. So if we increase the temperature of the hot reservoir, we have one minus uh, the temperature of the cold reservoir is 350 Kelvin, and the temperature of the hot reservoir will be 690 Kelvin. And in this case, the efficiency of the engine will be 49.3%. Now let's go ahead and see what happens if we reduce the temperature of the cold reservoir. So the efficiency, if we decrease the temperature of the cold reservoir, will be equal to one minus the new temperature of the cold reservoir, which will be 310 Kelvin, divided by the temperature of the hot reservoir, which is 300, I'm sorry, 650 Kelvin. And if we plug these numbers into a calculator, we can see that this will give us an engine with an efficiency of 52.3%. Uh, so by comparing these two, we can see that it is better to decrease the temperature of the cold reservoir with this engine than it would be to increase the temperature of the hot reservoir. So at this point, I think I'd like to end this video, and this will end their discussion of thermodynamics and gases. And in the next videos, I'll begin talking about the laws of physics that describe liquids.